In this D&D Tactica vlog, I want to share with you three different types of NPCs. These are three NPCs that I've used in a variety of games, always to interesting effect. And I say interesting because sometimes they've been very successful with what I was hoping to accomplish and other times not so successful. But these are three NPCs that all of my players have always remembered. Now, I want to sidebar for a moment and just jump into definitions. Henchman hireling versus NPC. A henchman hireling is essentially a stat block. They might have a profile. These are characters, NPCs, agents that the party hires to fulfill a certain role. More warriors, maybe a sage, maybe a halfling cook, whatever that's going to be. And uh, there's payment, there's treasure, there's expectation, there's experience. Uh, essentially, the players are allowed to control these stat blocks, these characters, for a specific purpose. And there might be different checks, leadership checks, morale, things like that moving into the game. NPC is kind of like a hireling, but under the control, in theory, of the dungeon master. They'll have a little bit more of a backstory, and this backstory can be very complex or it could be very simple. And they're working with the party for a specific reason. They also have a little bit more development in that they have their own goals and missions and reason for adventuring with the party. And again, this can be as complex as you have a complete character sheet with gear and skills and classes or just something as simple as a concept. Now, these are three different NPCs that I've used. The first was a rogue posing as a wizard. And uh, this was D&D 3.X, where everything was based on a DC and everything was based on a mad skill check. So what I had was a rogue, level 8, with full ranks into sleight of hand, forgery, pickpocket, move silent, all of these areas. Feats to support that. Obviously not the most optimized feat build, but to support those. And this rogue posed as a wizard, utilizing, dressed with the robes and has the staff and has all the stuff in the books. All legit, right? Use magic device, stuff like that to um, use scrolls and wands. But was using sleight of hand, flourish, acting, and different things to convince the party that he was very much a legitimate wizard. Now, why the heck was he doing this? Well, he was working for the Thieves Guild, of course, and the Thieves Guild, posing as the Thieves Guild, looking like a thief in the Thieves Guild, you're not going to get very far. He was looking to attach himself to a party at the inn to cooperate reasonably, but also to report back to the Thieves Guild because where the party was moving in the campaign we were playing, their actions were starting to become very tiresome to this Thieves Guild. So the idea was to dispatch some agents and kind of spy on the party and see what's going on. Now, as an NPC, I was playing this character with skill checks. So naturally, this NPC is going to hold back on the magic mojo because every time he would cast something, it's um, use magic device or it's a wand or it's the, the staff that he has, the elements to make it look like they were casting magic. I couldn't do it too much because for the legitimate wizard in the party, there'd be certain questions asked. Um, but I was able to play that because, of course, wizards in 3.x, where you had actual spells as opposed to burning sp spell slots and meta magic everywhere with D&D now, this idea that, yes, you have limited spells at the lower levels. You want to conserve them. So, no, I'm not going to blast that orc with magic missile. I'm going to hold it for something later. But every time I used magic, I had to make that sleight of hand. I had to make that flourish. I was making, um, I didn't want the players to be overly aware because obviously every time if I take an action with the NPC and I say, make a perception something check or make this type check or that type check, they're going to know something what's going on. But knowing the characters in the party, they're kind of base perception checks taking on an average. I would roll behind the DM screen for my flourishes and my sleight of hand and stuff like that and play that from the perspective of the players so they kind of see what's up. So that was interesting. An NPC that appears with all the trappings and skills and through skills and feats to pose as a different character class. 
Maybe a black guard posing as a paladin. Maybe a fighter posing as a paladin. Maybe a rogue posing as a cleric. Get all those donations to the Temple of Helm and pocket them all. A lot of different um, interesting aspects. So the second NPC, this was part of a bigger game. We were playing a campaign for about six or seven months at this point. Once a week. Pretty regularly. Once a week. And the party was making great progress at recovering some magic items, recovering some artifacts. Uh, This was set in a different time. Thieves Guild is trying to get in on that action. Um, There's some sort of hidden magical vault under one of the mountains in the realm, and something's in there, and everybody wants what's in there because everybody wants what's in there. It has to be pretty valuable. Well, what was in there was a banished ancient red dragon that was trying to manipulate things to make its way out. So with that perspective... How do we use an NPC there? Now, I had a friend um, wanting to jump in on the game. And if you've been following my D&D tactic of e-logs, or you've had the chance to sit down at my virtual or physical tabletop, everyone has a place at my table. Everyone can sit down at my game, even if you've never played D&D before, even if your other DM didn't show up and you're like, what do I do? I'm hanging out. You got a character, sit down, roll some dice, and let's do this D&D thing. So I had um, a friend of mine, unknown to the other players. They've never met this person before. He says, Fritz, uh, I want to jump in. I've got a slight change in my schedule. I'm good for like two or three months. And then that's it. Then I got to bail out. So can I jump in on your game? And I said, you know what? I can't even say where this idea originally came from, but I'm always trying new things. And this um, friend jumping in, you know, he was also a DM. We've been both players and DMs in each other's games. I said, are you up for something different? We'll give it a try. We'll see how it goes. No promises. So what I laid out was this expectation. What do you expect when someone else joins the game as the party? Like literally we're playing physical D&D tabletop. I've got seven players plus myself. If someone new joins the game and they've got a character sheet and they've got everything, you kind of take that at face value, right? Can you see where this is possibly going? So I said, you know, look, in the campaign, this Thieves Guild is is trying to challenge the party. They've got some agents. They've got some infiltrators. They've sent the assassin thing, all that type of stuff. But the players kind of know. They've been looking to infiltrate the party and have an agent in there to not only pipe back information. Because, you know, as a DM, while I, in theory, know everything, I need to separate out, hey, this is what the party's doing And the Thieves Guild opposing them, like, what would they reasonably know? They've got some agents, they've got some spies, but if the players are operating in an area that the Thieves Guild doesn't know, anything they do, anything they acquire, any contacts, that Thieves Guild is not going to know about it and needs to make decisions, future decisions in the campaign, based on that. So, So there is this divide as a DM. So I said, hey, what if I bring you in to my friend and we'll pretend we don't know each other, You sit down, you roll up a character. You are a plant, a real-time NPC played by a PC, not an NPC character that is working for the Thieves' Guild. I will fill you in based on what the Thieves' Guild knows. So they're not going to be a co-DM controlling an NPC. They're going to be an infiltrator to the party playing um, a real character. I said, I'll fill you in with what the Thieves' Guild knows about the adventure, knows about the party, and you play your character... And I want you to just cause some lighthearted chaos and also start filtering back info to the rest of the Thieves Guild. And, you know, if you see an opportunity to kind of mess the party over without getting caught, um, take it. And hopefully you align this for, you know, the last adventure or two before you have to leave the group. And he was a great sport. He was totally game and... Let's jump in. So he joins the party with his character sword hand, and he's kind of a a rogue fighter, you know, D&D 3.x again. Everybody's like rogue fighter, one level of wizard, so you can unlock everything and just just character class after character class. He's playing. He's got some better than average gear because the Thieves Guild hooked him up. He's filtering information from the quests back to the Thieves Guild. Now I'm playing it fair because he's not really an NPC, even though he's an NPC. When he's leaving information or he's doing things for an agent to pick up, there's um, some 
out of game skill checks. There's some out of game perception things. There's other NPCs interacting. He had to really play it careful because if there's a chance that he was discovered by the by the other players at the table or in between sessions, kind of our little mini role playing, what are you doing in between sessions? If he was discovered by the party, I, I've got to report that and he's got to play it. And he was like, well, I'll just pass it off like I'm, I'm taking bribes or whatever. So for two months, players, they're not really aware, but something's going on because the Thieves Guild is becoming a little more focused, um, a little bit more targeted with what's going on. This, this idea like, hey, they're knowing a little bit more about us. You know, maybe they've employed some wizards from the Wizards Guild to do that ESP scrying crystal ball thing. Maybe it's some of our hirelings. Like, what's going on on there? So they get a little more suspicious. So we're getting to the um, two months go by. And, you know, the my friend playing the NPC that's not an NPC but an NPC, he was playing his character, role-playing. He's getting some info fed. He was helping out the party. He was earning experience with the party. He was helping the party earn experience. Uh, they were tackling some encounters, and you know he really carried the weight through those encounters. So the party was definitely benefiting from that player. So we get about to the last month, and he's like, "I'm going to start setting things up because now the, the players, the players are like, something's going on here, right? The thieves guild's just getting way too coordinated. Something's going on." And uh, one of the players in my group, he always plays um, a rogue. Always, always, always. That's why I was like to my friend jumping, I'm like, you can't really play a rogue. I mean, unless you want to. I don't want to tell you what to play. But we've got a very good rogue in the party. And um, this rogue, we've played a long time together. He's played with some of the other members in the group. He's a type of player in a very good way that has to go after every single gold coin, magic artifact, every lead. Like, out of the dungeon, it's like, okay... We've completed the dungeon, but there's like, you know, 200 kegs because I'm populating the dungeon with, with effects. Um, often I'll use Dwarven Forge stuff and we'll use miniatures and I'll have lighting effects and spell effects. Just that's, that's the war gamer in me. Not that you need to play that with D&D, &D. but we've got the massive, um, you know, dungeon furniture and, and all that type of stuff. So we finish up the game. We finish up a dungeon, and I'm packing my stuff up, and the player playing the rogue is like, Fritz, um, whoa, 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 hold on. What about that? There's some loot there. How much is that? And I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, well, you've got 50 barrels there of, of what, ale? You know, it's like a storehouse off of a kitchen. I'm populating it with some barrels of ale just, just to, to look like something. And I'm like, what do you – barrels of ale? Okay, yeah, they're – they're just, um, you know, common wine and common ale. I, I don't know how much that's worth each, you know, 50 gold, 60 gold each. And he's like, okay, so that, that's like, it's like 800 and something gold there. He's like, we got to get that out of here. So he's like, you know, trying to figure out how do we get these barrels out of there to sell them and then playing that. So he's like, we're strip mining everything in this dungeon and we're, we're, we're taking it out of there. So from that perspective, he's out for the cash. And, and sometimes he'll, he'll really push that. So the player playing the NPC, not the NPC, but the NPC, is like, I'm going to start doing a little forgery. I'm going to start dropping some hints. I'm going to start dropping some, some packages for the party to discover, making it look like the rogue in the party is skimming a little bit of cash, which wouldn't necessarily be that unbelievable. So we got that a little bit going on where the rest of the party is like, all right, the Thieves Guild is now on to us. We've got the potential rogue in the party figuring out how to skim some cash and, and what's going on. So do we start like giving them less of a cut of the treasure? You got to be a good sport for this stuff. You got to know your target audience, right? I'm always want to try new things, but I, I don't want it to go too much off script. So we get to the final game before my friend playing the NPC, not the NPC, but the NPC is leaving. And uh, the other players don't know this. So they go through this maze and they fight some constructs and they storm the wizard's tower, and they make it to the top, and there's the magic artifact that, that they've been really, um, it's part of a machine, bigger artifact, that they've really been busting on, busting for, for, for real time, like four or five adventures. The um, player in the party with the NPC, not NPC, but NPC, walks up casually, right? We've got the dwarven forge, we've got the tower, he just walks up. The other party's like, all right, whatever. They're talking, we're in real time, we're still in initiative order, and um, he Casually takes this item, leaps off, leaps out the window. Featherfall jumps out and is like laughing. 
So then the party's like, what's going on here? And my friend, before he leaves, puts a letter down on the table explaining everything that he left back at the inn for the party to read. Now, how did that really go over? Um, There was some massive initial shock where they've been like, this player, real time, has been working with the Thieves Guild. We thought they were part of the party. Like, it was, it was crazy, the shock there. So it took a little bit to um, digest. Most of the players were really good-natured. They were like, hey, that's, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Some of the players were like, yeah, that was okay. It was kind of neat. Um, we got to experience it. I don't know again. And one player really was upset. Because it like they're like you know it should have been fully disclosed that this player was an NPC and working with the Thieves Guild and I'm like, well then that would kind of defeat the purpose. So NPCs that are not NPCs may be controlled by a co-DM or another player. If you do that, I would recommend um, not having the NPC controlled by a co-DM, but let them play at the table. That NPC they don't have direct knowledge of the DM. They might not know all of the pieces of the puzzle, and as a DM, the choices they make will interfere or affect or change the story. Okay, the last, the last group of NPCs, and uh, this is kind of a warning shot. I've used it one or two times only because there was no other way for me to get past this, and, and it's kind of a jerk move. I, I don't think I'm necessarily a, a jerk DM, but some could say I, I kind of get myself into these situations based on, on how I play D&D and what I am fine allowing to bring to the table or be brought to the table. So first, a little sidebar, sideline. If I'm playing d and I want you to play any character, any class, anything you want to play. So if we're playing um, Forgotten Realms and you're like, well, Fritz, I want to play a Warforged. There's no Warforged in Forgotten Realms. We'll, we'll bring it in. I don't know, in Eberron, there's some portal you jump through and you're in the Forgotten Realms right now. Everyone thinks you're just some sort of knight in armor. They don't know you're a living construct in there. You want to play a type of build that's this, that, this, that, then just give me the the sources so I can kind of have an idea of it and absolutely play it. I never put any limitations because as a player, I want you to invest in your character. I want you to be invested in the game. I want you to bring that passion to the table. Now, you can see where this is getting me into trouble because there's lots of different ways to enjoy D&D and lots of different ways to play D&D. And certain player types are very fine and very good, but if you give them too much, they're going to run with it. And then you've got to deal with kind of something interesting. So this player sits down at the table, and and I had played with him before, um, both as a DM and as a player, so I kind of knew they approach D&D as just... Um, number crunching, just stat blocks. If I can mash it together, if I can do it, then I'm, I'm going to do it. Because look, the rules say I can do it. It's not my fault it's not balanced. It's not my fault d a hot mess. Like, I'm going to do it. Okay, play whatever character you want to play. So we're going to start a campaign. Um, we kind of have session zero. I say, look, I'm open to anything. Bring up your character, level one. And we're probably going to go to level eight. I, I usually... We'll tell my players, uh, if we're playing in a campaign, this story will end around whatever level it ends at. You know, if you do the minimum, level five. If you do average, seven. If you do everything, eight or nine. Because I'm not trying to give away any spoilers, but I'm, I'm trying to impress. If you're planning your character, then you should know where the campaign's going to end. So if it's like the campaign's going to end at level three, maybe you're like, I don't want to play a wizard because I'm not going to get the Big Bang third level spells until I hit higher than that. And if the campaign's going to end, maybe I don't want to do that. I always play a monk, but I'm going to be honest with you, um, through all the editions of D&D, the monk at lower levels is kind of ho-hum, kind of hanging out, waiting to see what happens, but then the monk comes into power. So if it's a lower level campaign, maybe I don't want to play a monk, but I'll still play a monk. But if you're going to play a monk, Maybe you're like, okay, look, if we're going to level 10, that's great. If we're going to level 5, maybe I'll play a Paladin instead. So we have that session zero. Um, we show up for the first game in the campaign. We're set to play once a week. And I'm like, introduce your characters, right? M- many of us do this. So introduce your characters. Let's see what, what happens, what goes on. And this is a chance for the players to begin the game how they want to begin the game what they're comfortable with. So every player has a vision and a voice at my table. 
You can describe your character in great detail. You can read your bio. Um, I like as a DM for you to tell me a little bit about you know um, this um, character class. I've got these feats. Whether you want to read off the stat block or you want to like put it in an RPG format, you know all those things are good. So this way, I kind of know, and um, the players, the other parties will know. And the delivery system, a lot of different ways. So this um, this meta gamer, this power gamer. We're level one character, and he's like, he's like, all right, this is my character. You know, this is what they do, and he's he's reading off like stat blocks to describe it. So, level one, he's like, you know, I'm a rogue, half fey, elf, moon, something, true blood, something, something, this feat, all this crazy stuff, all legit, all mashing together from from all the supplements. Again, not his fault. This stuff's published, and I'm thinking about this, and I'm like. This character, if we're going on uh, CR challenge rating, they're like at like six or seven. So he's like, you know, three times a day, I can turn invisible at will, no interrupt, complete non-detection, plus 20 to stealth, move silent, hide in shadows, just just crazy, crazy stuff. And, and I'm looking at it and I'm like, well, he's not necessarily wrong. He's correct, and, you know, I'm like, well, Fritz, you, you allowed this, but I don't want to put any limitations on, right? We all enjoy D&D differently. So he's just, just destroying everything and anything he wants to do. So we start the game, and after two or three sessions, I'm like, I can't, I don't want to say stop this character, because you can have a really cool, um, I've played with some really cool character concepts that players have brought to the table, that on, on paper, looking at the stat blocks, you're like, this is so broken, this is crazy. They're just going to destroy everything. Why are we even bothering to show up to play D&D? If this is a war game, this is uh, just a, a powerful medalist. But they're such amazing role players and how they play the game and interact with a flourish. They're not abusing the character and stat blocks. They're making it fun and interesting. And I'm like, yes, that, that's why we're doing this D&D thing. So this power gamer did not go in that direction. I'm like, what am I going to do? I'm not going to ask them to leave the game because technically they're not doing anything wrong. And I allowed this. So I'm sitting there. I'm like, okay, well, it's time for some NPCs to start getting introduced to the party. And uh, this concept was, was out of desperation. I'm like, because I got to do something. Now, as a DM, I'm going to put stuff on the table. We're going to have encounters, we're going to have NPCs, we're going to do all that stuff, and, and you're going to be faced as a player with choices. How do you want to navigate it? I'm not going to throw stuff at you that's totally going to destroy you. Sometimes I go a little higher on the challenge rating if, if the party is a group of, of regular players or veteran D&D players. Likewise, if it's a totally new group, they've never faced D&D before, you know, we'll, we'll lower the challenge rating or we'll, we'll see what we can do. But you do whatever you want. I'm not going to railroad you. I'm not going to put you on the rails. I'm not going to speak for you. You do what you want. As soon as you roll the dice, that's it. No, no take backs, so to speak. So I'm going to utilize everything I can. The players were operating at this home base at an inn. They're going out into the mountain range and working with some dwarves and some mines and, you know, typical like level one to three stuff to get some gear, get some loot, get that party synergy and, and plant the backdrop to the seeds of what the party campaign is going to be. Every time they go out, so they're at this in this home base, they come back to the inn, and um, the character is playing the, the, the metagamer, super powerful, like he's at the inn, the party goes out. Okay. I cook up two NPCs that things happen, right? Real time in a D&D game. I'm tracking it. When the party is there at the inn, buying drinks and talking about their great tales and selling stuff and doing that. There are two other characters, NPCs, who, um, twin brothers essentially, kind of rogue slash bard slash bunch of stats, high charisma, high forgery, high persuade, high sleight of hand, poured everything into that, okay? They're there like just being seen with the party right? It's a crowd. It's a big in. They're just like seen with the party. Party leaves. Um, they're like, okay, we're going to stay here. This is our home base. Over the course of a few adventures, they convince everyone at the end that they're part of the party and they're staying here to like handle the logistics side, you know, deal, deal with that. 
And when the party comes back, they kind of fade into the background a little bit, get those um, headshots with the party. So we've established this, this precedent where the party goes out to adventure. These two NPCs are there at the inn pretending like they're part of the party, you know, holding down the fort and, and dealing with logistics and supplies and all that. Okay, we complete a couple of adventures. And uh, now we're getting ready to move to the city, to Northgate City, and start the second part of the campaign. The party is getting ready to leave. I, I had thrown so many encounters. Um, I had this one encounter, the last encounter before the party. Because if you can see th- where this is going, you're like, Fritz, it's really unfair. But this, and, and again, I created this. Here we are. But um, I had an encounter where there was some goblins. Now, you can only beat on goblins so much. And um, the goblins in the cave network that were raiding a caravan and doing all this stuff, you know, the usual low-level D&D stuff, the party found out that um, the goblins had this, these strange leather hoods that were, you know, shaped for a goblin to wear, hard leather, obviously stitched together, and um, there were no eyepieces or way to see, but they had these brass horns, multiple brass horns embedded, horns, H-O-R-N, not like uh, horn spikes, that were embedded in there that fed into the ear. So this way you, you kind of put this he- this helmet on, this hood on, you put the thing in your ear and you can hear, you know, like whatever, plus 10, plus 15 to, um, to listen checks. All the goblins have these. So I'm laying, I'm laying down the law, like, hey, something's going on. And the party's like, well, it's dark in the caves. Yeah, there's some torches. Maybe they're using it for mining. Who the heck knows what? So they get to the um, the big boss room, big goblin room, and the goblin in goblin language, you know, screams out every, to all the goblin warriors. They're fighting the party. Of course, my meta friend Power Gamer is just like killing like 10, 15 goblins a turn. You know, this is like at level two. It's it's just crazy. So, and, and I planned this before this encounter, before I even knew. The party, like I wrote this campaign before I knew who was sitting down. So I didn't tailor this specifically for the party or for my friend. So we're at the, the big boss encounter, you know, set level one, two, three type stuff. And um, the goblin chieftain is like, everyone, pull down the hoods. They, they all put on the hoods. He presses a button. Throne room opens up and um, outruns this basilisk who has like, you know, a stick on the basilisk back with like a little fishing rod holding like you know some little thing to eat in the front so this basilisk is just going nuts trying to zap everybody that it can see well the goblins can hear they're still fighting so the party's like yo and and it was like a lesser basilisk i I really toned it down um and of course there was a couple of ways if they did get turned to stone there was a couple of outs with some potions so it was more like a a let's have a memorable fun fight it is a little bit higher, absolutely, but there's some potions behind the throne because sometimes goblins get turned to stone feeding it, and maybe you got to bring them back. So it wasn't going to be a, uh, a permanent thing. could be a party wipe, but here we go. Um, the metagamer just destroys everything, and, and he's literally like, I'm immune to paralysis and turn to stone. I'm like, but you're level two, bro. Like, what? And he's like, well, here, because I'm fey, half moon, elf, blooded, true blood, this, that. He's like immune, 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 immune. I took this feat that opened this up with this book, immune, immune. I'm like, I can't stop you. I, I can't do anything. So it was really kind of a letdown um, with what could have been something memorable. Well, Fritz, you caused this. Okay. So we had that encounter. We get back to the end. The players are moving to Northgate City. And um, as the party is leaving, now these two, these two kind of NPC twin brothers, they, they left long ago. And the party was never aware of them. So the, um, the party's leaving the inn to start the next part, and the innkeep and a few merchants come up to specifically the power gamer, and um, they're like, hey, you, you got to settle up. You owe us a lot of money. You owe us a lot of money. You owe us like, like 3,000 gold pieces, you know, something like, like most of the haul for that. And, of course, that power gamer saw gold as a way to acquire new items to further... Um, enhance the the absolute unstoppability power gaming element of it. So the gold was very important. The gold was very important because this was going to open up some items and some other things to make them even more unstoppable. He's like, I ain't paying anything. I didn't sign those contracts. And they're like, yes, here they are. Here's your signature. 
they're like, we have witnesses. We've seen it. You got to pay up. Now there's some armed guards there. Um, other people are starting to watch this this situation developing, and the rest of the party's like. We've got a whole campaign. I, we don't know what this is, but, like, is this a fight we want to undertake? And, like, what's going on? So the met, metagamer, power gamer is like, I'm going to just roll for initiative. He's like, roll for initiative. I'm going to slaughter everybody. I'm like, you, you can't slaughter people in an inn. I'm not going to stop you. Party talks him down and is like, look, you, you can't do this. Um, they put two and two together. Some people are like, well, look, every time you guys were here, these two other party members were with you. When you left, they said that they were with you, and we believed it, and they ran up a tab in your name, and they're buying drinks for everybody, and then when you came back, you paid them, and this and that, and okay, we kind of see what's going on. We've got a little forgery. We've got a little um, little stuff going on. So they pay. My power gamer, metagamer friend pays all of his gold. He's, he's pissed. He's more pissed than the rogue who wants, wants tons of gold, and they go to Northgate City. Okay. They get to Northgate City, and um, we had a couple of encounters along the way. So I'm like, all right, maybe the power gamer, metagamer got the point. You know, chill it out a little bit. Play your interesting character, but, but just, don't, just don't ruin it as you're doing it for everybody. Otherwise, I, I, can't th- I literally can't throw anything at you within a, a plus three challenge rating band because it's just, it's just not going to happen. I, I'm, I can't run anything on this. You go take on the boss right now and somehow win and you're level four. Like it's just, it's just impossible. So maybe you've chilled out a bit, you know, and, and we move forward and I'm like, you know, I'm dropping a couple of hint bombs here where it's like, you're going to Northgate city and, um, you know, this is now going to be a little bit more social. There's going to be some info gathering. There's going to be some NPC interaction. So let's get into this role play thing and not just mashing stat blocks together for, um, extreme meta. Along the way, there's a couple of encounters, you know, give the party some XP, give some loot, find out some info, make some choices, make, meet some new NPCs, and he's just obliterating everything. Nothing's changed. Okay? So they get to Northgate City. Um, they're walking through the streets, and the power gamer, meta gamer friend looks over, and there's, there's a couple of posters everywhere. Wanted for debt. Wanted for fraud. Wanted for, you know, just stealing money everywhere. And it's that player's picture. So it quickly becomes established that after the two um, brothers left the inn, NPC brothers, they went up to Northgate City and just did the same thing, forgery. Um, We had magic illusions to change their appearance to make them look like this other half fey moon elf, true blood, whatever. And and now um, the metagamers, he can't control this. And I'm like, all right, I got to start backing this off because he's like, he's like, I'm going to kill these guys. They're dead. I I don't know wherever they are. They are dead. So he's like, whatever we're doing in the campaign, I'm going to find them and kill them. And he's just going nuts. So I'm like, all right, I tone it down. They pay off their debts. We're done. He still is power gaming. He's still doing on. I realize I I can't control anything. So we'll see what happens. But now we bring in a a plot twist before we get to the, the kind of end note footnote for NPCs, three different NPCs to try out or to explore. So we're getting towards, um, I don't know, the party's like level six, level seven. They're not at the boss dragon hidden under the mountain yet type thing, but they're, um, they're getting ready to get some pretty powerful magic items. So my meta gamer friend is like, I can use these artifacts and do this and do that. And like, so I I don't even know how he, he did it at this point, but he's like, I can, and this is like at level six or seven. He's like, I can have my character, but now with this, some obscure class, I can do this and create a shadow. It wasn't shadow dancer, but like I can create a shadow double of myself at like 25%. But because I've got this feat and I use this magic object, it's actually like a shadow clone at full strength. So now I, I got to deal with two of you on there. Look, that could be a cool concept if you role play it, shadow twin type stuff and and you know, that, that could be interesting, but he's just like, now I got another stat block that I'm just going to destroy everything. And the rest of the players are like, what are we going to do? How far is too far? So I bring back the, um, I bring back the two brothers. And this time though, the party has to work with them because they have intimate knowledge through 
their rogue abilities and bard abilities and, and basically doing what they're doing. They know where the artifact is. They know how to get it. And they know what to do with it to give it to the party. So they're like, they make an offer where it's like, we'll join the party. We'll do it. And um, the power gamer, metagamer player, he's like, and now he's in conflict, like literal conflict where he's like, I want to kill these two on sight. I don't even care of my reputation hit. I don't even care what it does to the game. I want, I want these two dead. But they know where this artifact is. And there's probably other artifacts. And then maybe I can make a third shadow clone and now like do this and do that. Like, so he's like, he's like, I, I don't know what to do. Like you can see he's like short circuiting where he's like, do I allow this? Do I go with them? So they're in the party. Okay. They're in the party. Things kind of work out. Um, we end the game. Somehow the two brother NPCs escape, and um, that's where it ends. Now, the NPC stuff, I, I will reuse NPCs and reuse these concepts through different things. And these two brothers, masters of forgery, master of stealth, master of sleight of hand, master of pickpocket, uh, they like to cause a lot of trouble within the party, outside of the party. You know, if you wrong them, they're going to try and get you that type of stuff. So occasionally I'll, I'll bring them back um, in different campaign settings, in different NPC settings, in, in a much, much lesser role. Because they, they had some cool stat blocks and things to have some fun. But another friend of mine who's always playing a rogue, who was there for this event, to, to see this Power Gamer event. So he was through that campaign. He's been through numerous other campaigns um, with me over time. He's probably one of the longest D&D friends that I've been DMing with at this point. I'm having them as a player at my table. So for the next like four or five games, and this is a separate, um, separate campaign, reset the campaign, reset the world, separate group coming through, separate storylines, separate everything. When they walk into an inn, um, my friend is like, okay, I scan the crowd. Do I see anyone that are two identical twins that look like this and i'm like as a dm i'm like well what does that mean he's like i'm just saying i'm just checking i'm like you have no idea that who to check for or what that even means or what to look like i'm like that's out of character knowledge this has been reset like yeah you see a lot of people that that are at the end you're looking for like these two specific brothers you've never met them and um so every time he's just like he's like i'm looking for him i'm looking for him one time i did bring them in to um, as friendly to the party, to work with the party. So they're not always opposing the party, to work with the party with some forgery skills. They, these two brothers kind of got into some trouble with the Thieves Guild, and now they have to make a hasty exit, and they bring their skills and knowledge from the Thieves Guild operations in with the party, and the party's basically like, they're like, if you protect us, we'll help you. We've got some good skills. So they were not there to oppose the party. But when they introduced themselves with a flourish... My friend, different character, we're now like, you know, real time two years later, I could see the look in his eyes like, yo, these, these are them. These are the two brothers. Like, and I'm like, I'm giving them like, you know, real time telepathy backwards. Like, yo, don't spoil my NPCs. This is out of character knowledge. You've never met these two. You have no idea who they are. You have no idea what they're going to do. The rest of the players don't know, but we didn't have any power gamers in there. So this, this third um, group, yes, I did create the issue myself. Um, by allowing anything to go at my table, I gave lots of warnings. There were lots of different chances to approach it. The rogue in the party wanted to basically um, hire them and work with them. Be like, yeah, you, you cost us like 20K in gold. Let's get you on the payroll for real and use you as some NPCs. And we can make some serious cash. That would have been a way to turn it around and do it. There's always a choice. But this these two would have been my least popular for obvious reasons, um, NPC. But sometimes you bring in NPCs that are not there to fight. They're not there to, to work with the party in the traditional manner. They work behind the scenes with the party. They work behind the scenes against the party. There, there's things that are escaping the meta stat block mess that d d is now, NPCs that way. So three NPCs I've regularly used. And if you've been at my table physical or virtual, you've probably seen these at different points in, in different ways. And again, the idea is sometimes it works really well and the players have a good laugh about it. Sometimes um, not so well, but as a DM, I'm always trying to do something different. I'm always trying to make something, some element in that game memorable. 
So it's literally years and years and years later. But we're still talking real time about some of these crazy NPCs that have appeared in different incarnations through my campaigns. Now, turning it over to my fellow D&D enthusiasts, my fellow D&D players, my fellow D&D content creators, what are some different and interesting NPCs that, that not only break the mold, but are just utilized in different ways within the D&D structure that you've brought into your game? And what are some different NPCs that I should be considering, with full credit to you, absolutely, after the fact, that I should be bringing into my own games, my next game?